Okay. Okay. So I'm here with Gino, who I've met through a synchronistic storm. This is our first contact, and we're beginning as potential allies or potential anything, just to kind of see in this discussion where each is at. And I think this is happening on the planet everywhere right now. And okay, I'll give you a quick download. Uh, I've basically, for about 25 years, been developing something called the Inflow Matrix. And what it is, it's a holistic business thinking system. It's a series of maps that can organize any job, any organization, and any community, and then bring those together with a, an infrastructure that supports a person to design their ideal job. So that the gifts of the person is the reference point as opposed to the products as the commodity. So it's looking at the prime reference point of the whole economic system as being gifts versus products and being able to distinguish the paradigms, being able to distinguish the old paradigm from the new paradigm and having something called the new paradigm toolkit, which are maps, card sets, game boards, processes and software to assist individuals, organizations, and communities into the new paradigm by giving them an infrastructure that actually in language fits on sacred geometry. Got it. And where are you in that process right now? Well, I, I've got a lot of prototypes that are kind of like, um, like I've sort of invented a new way of divination. I've got a, a, a maybe 10 game boards. I've got maybe 10 card sets, uh, the ability to probably create hundreds of card sets. Gamified, Wonder, wonderful. So I'm, uh, I do, I'm a professor at a university, associate professor, and I've been in digital entertainment for 30 years, but the last 15 years I do research in consciousness, in okay. phenomenology and neurophysiology. And where I intersect with you in relation to this is we're reframing entrepreneurship and organizational culture looking at it from the perspective of personal development. Okay, yeah. And so a couple of things. One is with entrepreneurs, I run a workshop all around the world called Entrepreneurship, Innovation, and Self-Discovery. And the tagline for that is entrepreneurship as a spiritual path. So whenever there's a, there's a passion or a desire, working through a conditioned worldview, which is your belief system, with or against the unknown, which is nature, the universe, or God, there's an opportunity for transformation. So what are the stories driving the emotions? What are the emotions motivating the action? And as you do something, how does the reality respond? And as the reality responds, how, how does that make you feel? And it's helping people understand that loop. Okay. And what we found is that the success of a startup company or a large corporation correlates to the level of consciousness of the entrepreneur or the management team. And what I mean by their level of consciousness is their ability to maintain presence. Can you be still grounded, centered, and connected to intuition while the shit is hitting the fan all around you? In relation to this and a skill that you have that you've been doing that, that's of tremendous value to me is we're working with organizations and shifting their senior management and then working with them to engineer the mythology, the art, and the rituals that define the culture of the company. And so a lot of these gamified processes that we'd have, you have at the, at the meta archetypal level, we would instantiate into their culture, into their stories and everything, and then we would create tools for them. I think there's a big difference, I guess, in working with organizations that are already structured, already, you know, they're either working or they're not working, versus yeah. the individuals and new startup tech companies that are yeah. coming out now, right? Like there's a yeah. big difference between those, I guess. Very big. Yeah. Because I, I think that the as these ones are sort of sinking, because they can't sort of uh, operate the same way they did, the, sorry, this is the things on my students. The, the new things are coming. Like there's just, you know, the, the old is dissolving, the new is being born, but the basic infrastructure seems to be, you know, the cryptocurrencies and the new currency system seem to be the, the real breakout point because there's so much, I think, corruption, you know, regarding the number systems of old, old paradigm business that there, there needs to be a new reality because that you know, the, the house of cards is falling apart and pretty quick. Yeah, and then we, we were looking at systems that f smooth and facilitate that transformation as well. Yeah. And so one of the projects we have is we're using kind of blockchain technologies to create personal currencies that are backed by all of your assets when you die. And so it's kind of like a will token. And so uh, 
And so if you think about this, we'd, if you signed up, we'd give you kind of these Elijah tokens that you could use in any which way while you're alive. And then um, when you die, all of your assets go to backing that coin. <clears throat> And so if you, if you think about it, a, a big chunk of it will go to family and loved ones. Another chunk of it may go to causes that you believe in. And then another chunk will go into, let's say there are services or events or education, or let's say you're trying to raise financing for a new startup that you could go to f friends and family and people that knew you really well, and you could make loans off of these will tokens. I mean, that really changes the nature of, uh, for creators and inventors, right? Yeah. Who, who have strong. Well, and it's making things more relational rather than transactional. And you're investing in people and not companies. And so that's a sample of the kind of projects that we work on in, in developing uh, for that. That's fascinating. Uh, William also told me about a spiritual emergency network that you were building. Yeah. And so we have a whole model of personal development from birth through awakening. And it comes from a very simple ontology that's kind of based upon phenomenology from a non-dual perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, and I look at physiology, the research that I do, I look at physiology as hardware and phenomenology as software. And so physically you're in Vancouver, physically I'm here in Hong Kong. And in this conversation, we seem to be somewhere. If I mention, I don't know, Stanley Park, and you know what I mean, are there certain neurons in my brain that are now wired like yours? So what's the relationship between this mental space and the physical body? And that's what I research. And so, and so from a non-dual perspective in that way, uh, everything in the universe, you either know from what's physically around you, which you know from your senses, there's the internal processes of whether you're hungry, thirsty, or have to go to the bathroom. And there's what you know from thought. And everything in the entire universe at any one moment is in one of those three categories. I just a quick question. Uh, yesterday, yeah. when we just met, I, I brought up, you know, how many people have uh, models of cycles of time and levels of consciousness in the same yeah. model. And you said that that's what you were talking about in, your, in the group that you were in. Could you go deeper into that? Because... Uh, I find that is the core for whatever my own work has been. So, so yesterday, I think it was yesterday, these days are blurring. I was with a group of people that were looking at the new systems for companies and, and everything, kind of like you, what you were talking about that, that tie into ethics, kind of consciousness, but not conscious capitalism, but a whole new way of structuring organizations and everything around consciousness. That was the, the group that I was with before, uh, yesterday. Uh, I have a, we have a model of development um, of which entrepreneurship is one stage. Very briefly, when you're born, you're kind of tabla rasa, at least in terms of mind, body. <laughs> you know, there's, and experience binds symbols and thought to processes in physiology. And very basically, stage one is you buy into consensus reality. So your parents lay their conditioning on you, the education system and society, and they tell you what reality is. And so most people are in that realm. Hmm. Stage two is you look at consensus reality and you say, fuck this shit, I'm going all in on one thing. And so all of these outliers that are pushing the envelope, any true artist, any true entrepreneur, any true scientist, you have to leave the realm of the known. You have to go into the unknown, discover the fire, and then, and then that's kind of the hero's journey. Mm. Uh, generally, though, is when you push really hard uh, your physiology, what ends up happening is um, yeah, you break through the homeostasis of the, the physiology and the ego. And when you're high energy, open, and focused and open, as you probably know, surreal shit starts happening. <laughs> Coincidences, synchronicities, these things line up. And then if you don't let go of the story making part of the brain, you start trying to figure it out. And then even more surreal shit starts happening. And then you end up in a positive feedback loop. And then pretty soon you're not eating right, you're not sleeping right. And then the physiology can't maintain that energy. And then there's a crash. And so usually what happens for people going through that process in modern society is surreal shit starts happening. You can't figure it out. Even more surreal shit starts happening. You try to tell your friends and your parents about it. They think you're nuts. And then you end up in a mental hospital. Yeah. And then 
you end up on pharmaceuticals and everything, and then you have a bad experience of it, and then you go to depression because your energy system is tightly coupled to the beliefs, and the implementation of that is the nervous system. And any attack on that is is basically, it's like death. <laughs> Um, and to decouple from that is very, very difficult. And so a lot of these people, once you pop, uh, the other big problem with it is that you, um, it's like seeing your parents naked. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so the stories that used to drive you don't mean anything anymore. And so a lot of these people end up homeless. And so, uh, you know, in mental hospitals, on pharmaceuticals and or homeless. So what we're doing is we're finding places all around the world in nature and uh, building a network of people that have gone through the process to help midwife people. You know, the original idea of it, the short of it was it's like a Betty Ford clinic for people going through awakening. But now we have this term uh, Antarabhav. So we've got the domain name and everything. And Antarabhav is the Sanskrit word for the bardos, basically. <laughs> the, the space between life and death. <laughs> which is kind of where, <laughs> so it's like a rebirth for the people that are coming through. And the process is very much a, a midwifery process. And so, you know, from a scientific perspective, if I ask you to be hyper aware of everything that's going on right now, if we maintain eye contact and speak, there's a physiological resonance. And if I bring your, if I ask you to bring yourself fully present, you'll notice you can feel, you can be aware, and you can feel what's going on in your body, but you can't think. And then if you have eye contact with somebody and you bring them fully present, someone that's manic, you can kind of bring them here and then let's see if we, this works online with you. But if I go from here to just. And all I'm doing right now is I'm shifting into stillness. <laughs> and then if you've got someone that's manic, what happens is all of the energy moves from the head into the dentian area and then they fall asleep. And once they can fall asleep a couple nights, then they'll go back to their natural state. Yeah, I, I've seen quite a few people like that and been in my own situations. And, and a big part is they are not able to integrate the new knowledge. They are not into like whether yeah. it's a psychedelic experience or not their normal family and friends don't. And so one of the people that you have nearby you that's in that state right now, from my opinion, is uh, Attila. Really? I, I would say- Attila, I had an ex okay. Attila had an experience last year, which popped him out. And then he was able to ground himself in Thailand um, but then right now he's, uh, he has no money. <laughs> he's trying to uh, figure out what to do next in life. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, we've met a, a couple of times and he, he, see, he, to me, he has a very high skill set. We have good yeah. rapport. I have lots of projects that need help that- uh, Excellent. We're starting to talk and, and, and uh, I, I, I think, my, my guess is he's come out the eye of the needle on the other side a bit. I mean, he's gone through I, I sense he's ready to jump back in and yeah. I can kind of help mentor and at least uh, be there as a supportive uh, older male because I, I've been around uh, enough of it. That's for sure. So there are three things I'm working on, actually four things I'm working right now, but the three uh, of which the, the uh, Antarabhav is the second. Okay. The first thing I'm working on is, um, I found out, and it'll require some explaining, but um, are you familiar with the term the newosphere? Yeah. Okay, the newospheres are arguably where this mental realm is. Yeah. Uh, the ancient Greeks were very careful to distinguish between the term phusis and techne. I don't know if you know what those terms are. No. Phusis means nature. And techne is things that have gone through the filter of the mind. Okay. And so if a star in the heavens went supernova, the ancient Greeks would say that's phusis because nobody ever touched that star and it's acting of its true nature. Okay. Versus everything that you see around you, if you're indoors, came from somebody's mind. 
you know, someone invented glasses, someone invented the English language, your shirt, everything. And so if you think of the material world, it's the collective intention of everyone that's ever existed projected into nature. And so in that sense, our modern world is kind of like Minecraft. And so all the architecture, all the laws, all the languages, all of these were developed by the people before us. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think of the birth of the newosphere, think of biblical Adam or the first person that became self-aware. <laughs> the whole new sphere for them was just their experience of the moment and what they remember. <laughs> and then now for thousands of years, it's been like everybody, and it, it, with each new generation and each PhD thesis, it continues to grow in terms of what we know about reality and space and time and everything. Mm. Now in, in, uh, in Adam's case, or the first person that became consciously aware, their whole job in life was to put a roof over their head get food, avoid the predators, procreate. You know, it's a pretty basic life, but there was no nature, there were no streets, there were no laws or anything. It was just him slash her in nature. Now, if you look at the modern world today, it's actually fairly complex and you have to make enough money and all of this and you have to figure out how, how to play the game. Not only nature, but then you have to figure out, you know, modern society depending on where you're at and it's pretty confusing and complicated. Turns out when you were born, you were just like biblical Adam. And you have to kind of accelerate to, you know, rather than just finding for it, foraging and shelter, you actually have to make money and put a roof over your head, et cetera. And this is the, the structures that we have that you're talking about that are in transition. But we have those structures today. And so just as when your mother, when your father had sex with your mother, when he had an orgasm, 300 million sperm made it, or 300 million sperm came out, and you were the one that made it. <laughs> and, you know, you went through the vagina, the uterus, you know, you chose the right fallopian tube, and, and you were the one that made it. You know, I'm just, you're talking about working on three things, and I'm thinking by the way you're going, this could take 10 years to get to the point. No, 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 I, no. so the point behind this is that the modern world is like another techne vagina complex. And so there are 7 billion people that come out and then of them, some of them make it. And so for me, I'm a tenured professor. So unless I sleep with a student or commit a felony, they can't fire me. I have a nice house and you know, I'm, I'm kind of surviving. And, 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 but other people like, like, like Attila is still trying to work his way to the surface. You know, and some people, they have three kids, you know, four jobs. They're thrashing really hard just to try to stay afloat. Some people with student debt are literally financially underwater. Yep. And so the whole point is we're creating, the first thing is I'm getting people that don't have to worry about money anymore. And so these are like tenured professors, people that are entrepreneurs that have had exits, people that are trust fund people, et cetera. And what we're doing is we're setting up an advisory consulting mentoring group for entrepreneurs in an entrepreneurship as a spiritual path kind of way. Okay. Now, the problem that you have when you're working with entrepreneurs, especially is, hey, we're in startup mode. I'd like to hire you, but I can't pay you. And, you know, are you worth the equity and what equity are you worth? And, you know, there's haggling over all that. And you could say, hey, I'll help you raise money, but I'll take a cut of it and everything. And yep. that... that that self-interest survival mode taints the whole relationship and everything. Yeah. And then it creates more conflict and everything. So the idea is to keep that clean. And so we have these people that are in this class and each person has a portfolio of companies and entrepreneurs that they're mentoring. And the way we do it is we have a whole program, we have a whole process. How do we use language metaphysically? How and why are things playing out the way they are? And then if there's ever a liquidity event, if there's an exit, then the entrepreneur takes a percentage of what they own pers make personally, not the whole equity stack, just what they make personally. And then that goes to the person that, that supported him. And then part of that goes to the group. And so that's kind of like a new way of looking at supporting entrepreneurship and mentoring them. Okay. It, without needing to deploy capital, but it's really taking kind of this mentorship and this uh, stewardship seriously. The next thing above that is this, uh, and Tarabov, and that's basically the safety net for people that <laughs> pop too hard. 
<laughs> which can happen with, when you're dealing with entrepreneurs. And then the thing above that is a global decentralized mystery school. Okay. And so modern society is pretty good at kind of these stage one people in terms of consensus reality. By definition, that's what it is. And it's kind of okay for the stage two people. But then for the stages above that, it's horrible. There's no infrastructure for that at all. Yeah. And so that's the problem I'm looking to address. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're basically, I think we're kind of doing the same thing with different language. Is, yeah. Is my guess. I mean, I can sort of have a, I look at what I'm doing. It's very similar. Um, and I think, you know, the need of the moment dictates certain remedies that, you know, are obvious to sort of intelligent people, right? Like at some point there's only a certain way of dealing with it. And I think what you've done in those three levels is very, I like it because it does give the distinction between the players in a way that's necessary. And I think there, there there's just so much, um, like one of the things I'm working on right now is a, a multiple chat room software where you can actually distinguish the type of conversation you're in. So let's say you just move from storytelling and I'm just moving to an, a bit of an instruction where I'm starting. Is that, is that text or is it voice? Right now it's text. I mean, it could be both. It could be because I've developed a language structure. It could work in any technology. Wonderful. There's a guy in, in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, I can introduce you to, and then they've been working with call centers mm. and they can tell because they use AI and they've got a big corpus of conversations is they'll tell you um, within a minute, how long the conversation is going to last for a call center and everything. And so they, they analyze text in, in this way. They parse text and they look at how people use, how people using words, the language and everything mm. to tell you what you're dealing with and how long the conversation is going to be. Mm. There's another group, if you're doing voice, that do voice analysis and they'll tell you the emotional state of the person and all this other stuff based upon the, 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 the tonality and the quality of their voice. Okay. Well, okay. So you're, I mean, those are two, uh, I guess, aspects or variables. I mean, what I see is, is like the central reference point. Right? I mean, we're basically in the central reference point right now, a human conversation. And what's happened in our lifetime is, you know, this explosion of communication technologies, but the actual ability to communicate to take someone from here to there may not be as developed. I mean, you're a professor, right? You're a PhD. This is your job to do so. Yes. Uh, not only that, it's my main e research area as well. Okay. And so I research, you know, if we look at what's happening, even when we have a conversation, all of my past experiences from when I was born to today are encoded in my physiology. Mm -hmm. All of your past experiences from when you were born to today are encoded in your physiology. When I speak to you, I'm holding my physiology in a certain state. And I, this would be a map of me sort of saying what you're saying, that I'm one side, you're the other side, but coming through some structures. Well, the, wonderful. And what, what I do is I take that graph that you have there, and I look at it as physiological processes. Hmm. And I would take that map, and I would place... Uh, this is 72 conversations and say that I'm in one of them and you're in another and that's unconscious. But using software, we could have a little thing above us saying, let's say I'm in a instruction and you're in a, maybe an enrollment and bringing more consciousness to the type of intention that each of us has in this conversation and moving from the, you know, humans, talk about anything and it can go anywhere and you know the most I guess uh, the best entrepreneurs keep the conversation very specific to what they want to have occur in that communication while people who aren't successful talk about anything and can go anywhere but they don't realize the impact of their words that's persuasion mm. Mm. <laughs> the penny dropped <laughs> 
so you've you've got a systematized model for dissecting conversations and making people aware of how they're where and how they're acting from is that correct that's part of it because it's a holistic system i could list a whole bunch of other functions um, i've got something called the time translator which is nine cycles of time which is looking yeah, that's your your circles yeah and that's this is just one this is just the minute cycle and yeah. so there's it's it's like I, I i got really interested in objects to facilitate you know deeper conversations and using tools right like people like here there's a uh, like value cards that are like a hundred values that I found when you move information and put them on cards and then you can, you can create patterns that let's say here, if you're putting a card here and, you, and you're, you're, you're making a pattern on sacred yeah. geometry and the mind seems to access a higher level of consciousness when it does so. Interesting. That's very interesting. Have you, uh, and so you're, are you building apps with this and stuff or? Well, I'm, I'm currently working with one programmer who, as I said, we're building the chat rooms, but I, I mean, I've got, you know, I've had 25 years of, of pure focus of invention and not being in the traditional school system. So. Oh, okay. What's your background? It's, it's just eclectic or? Very eclectic. Like I was studying spiritual masters and business systems. I, I mean, I started, I went to a master's at Saybrook and uh, institute you know in san fran and it just it was just too expensive for what they were giving me so i mean i've continued on with my research and i'm sort of like you know i'm a fringer right i haven't published papers i haven't really told many people about did what you I've did you get a bachelor's degree i have a bachelor of education from mcgill but oh great oh wonderful Canada. Other, other than that um but i have working prototypes i mean i have like, as I said, like actual tools that I've tested for about 15 years that work that um, are all incomplete. Like my, I can't complete anything. I mean, I've got my own weaknesses and, and, the, and my lifestyle hasn't been the greatest towards, you know, like, like I have a community communication room, the whole thing, you know, ready to go. Not quite ready to go, but I'm just. What's been holding you up? Why haven't you been completing? <laughs> Well, I've, I haven't been working in the, or in, in the normal systems. I haven't been, yeah. I've been a, an outsider, right? I'm, I'm more yeah. of an activist. I've been trying to protect trees. I, you know, I don't sort of uh, fall in line with your basic infrastructure places, right? And I've sort of learned, I, I just went off the farm and never came back. And, and now, and now it's, it's, it's like I've, People like William are the people I've talked to, like the other fringers who are kind of anomalies. And so, how are you financially? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just. I've got a couple of media team. Like I've, I'm just starting to bring it into the world. So, and I'm doing it kind of like little step by step by step. But I mean, I've had these for twelve years, and I got made twenty eight of them. Like every business on the planet could use this card system. I, I definitely have blocks around bringing my work into the world. And then are you married, kids? No, I put my work first. Wow. Like, I, I mean, I, sorry. Relationships, though, or do you have a Yeah, I'm, living with, or? I'm living with a woman right now, so I have a, a girlfriend. Um, How long have you been together? About a year. Okay. And then your longest relationship is... I'm lucky if I can get past two years. Okay. No, I'm I'm married, with four kids, uh, and uh, 22 years now. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Very different lifestyle. Yeah, but I'm just trying to get a sense of. Yeah. No. In terms of gamifying the stuff that you've got, very interesting. Happy to collaborate with you on that. I have manufacturers for that kind of stuff here in China. Very easy. Okay. Very easy. Awesome. Like, cause I, I mean, I just, I just need some real help on the business side in terms of, uh, I just, I've had a lot of like hanging out with spiritual visionaries, hanging out with activists. I've, I've hanging out with sort of like non-business people yeah. and, and seeing how limiting that is because they, they just, they don't create infrastructure. 
You know, it's, it's a lot of independents uh, who have a lot of brilliance, who are doing great things, but there, there's n never a stronger organizational design. And that's, and the strange thing is that's where all my attention went. Let me share something with you, if you don't mind. It'll take about five minutes. Sure. So I research phenomenology and neurophysiology. So phenomenology is your experience of the moment through the senses. Neurophysiology is what's going on in your brain. And so just like your computer, there's a relationship between hardware and software. There's a relationship between the mind and the body. As an example, I'm going to do this close up. As an example, if I ask you to stare in my eyes right now, wherever my eyes are, now, without moving your eyes, can you tell me what you had for lunch four days ago? <laughs> I couldn't tell you what I was doing 10 minutes ago. No, well, it's difficult, but while you're staring at me, you have access to your peripheral vision. You can smell what your room smells like. You can feel your breathing. Basket and wiggle your toes right now. You can actually do that while you're staring at me. And phenomenologically, this feels a certain way. I want you to remember how this feels. And I'm gonna ask you another question. You can move your eyes if you'd like, but I'd like you to answer the question. And the question is, what's 17 multiplied by 13? And you can move your eyes if you want. 17 times 13, 191? More than that. It's freezing. It's 170 plus 51, yeah. which is 221. Now you'll notice to do the calculation, you're gonna disconnect from this and you're gonna go into thought. And so it turns out we're either present or we're in thought, but you can't do both things at the same time. It's a hardware problem. Now watch this, maintaining eye contact again. What's one plus one? Two plus two. Four. Do you love your parents? Yes. So there are certain things that you can answer from presence. So it turns out if what I'm saying is consistent with your embodied worldview, you can stay present with me like this. But as soon as I say something that has an implication that's different from your embodied worldview, you're going to look away to process. So by knowing what I'm saying and seeing how you respond, I can start mapping out what your belief system is. And once I know what your belief system is, I have all the tools that I need to communicate with you more effectively, manipulate you, or reprogram you. Now, it turns out that thought in your experience of the moment through the senses uses the same hardware. It uses the same endocrine system, which regulate your hormones, and it uses the same autonomic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response. But the issue is your awareness doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know the difference between the stimuli coming from thought versus what's coming from the moment through the senses. So if I can bring myself fully present so that my autonomic is only triggered by what's physically threatening me, which from an evolutionary psychology perspective was why it was developed, right here and right now, everything's fine. And the natural state is joy. And so where is fear, frustration, anger, and anxiety coming from? It's coming from thought. Not only that, if you said to me right now, fuck you, Gino, you're full of shit. And then if I said, hey, Elijah, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Can you help me out? Then there's no conflict. If I can let go of the stimuli coming from here and I, I, I can discern the difference between this and this, and if I can stay grounded here and let this go, what could you ever possibly say to me to create an argument? Yeah, the only time there's going to be an argument is when there's an emotional attachment on one side bumping up against an emotional attachment on the other. If I let go of all emotional attachment on my side, no conflict. Not only that, you weren't born with this belief system. By seeing how you frame things, I can literally see your past trauma. And what I mean by that is if I touch your hand like this, you're fine. But if you had like an open gash, like an open infected wound, if I just touch it a little bit, you're going to jump. And so what I represent to you and what the symbols of the conversation represent are touching a wound in your psyche which then triggers your autonomic nervous system, which is why you then lash out at me, which then triggers my autonomic nervous system, which is why I lash out at you. And that's how conflicts arise. 
Now you're gonna notice if we agree to maintain eye contact and speak, you have no access to conceptual knowledge. You can speak from your heart, you can speak from your embodied knowing. If it's something that's happening in this moment, like me noticing you putting your, ha your hand you know, on your cheek, we can talk about it. But if it's something you only know conceptually, you will not be able to access it from this. And you're gonna notice, just as you can process what I'm saying right now, you can actually feel your breathing and you can be aware of your breath. Now, if you breathe deeply from your belly, in, in, in Chinese, we call this dantian, so you're using your diaphragm and breathing from your belly. If you breathe deeply from your belly and try to feel angry at the same time, it's very difficult. Anger is a chest breath, fear is a held breath. And you're gonna notice as I'm speaking to you right now, you can actually be aware of your breath. And as soon as you go into thought, you're gonna lose awareness to breath. And once you lose awareness to breath, you lose awareness to your own emotional state. And so if you agree to maintain eye contact and speak, most arguments will die away very, very quickly. And so although our autobiographical histories are different and our genetics are different, the underlying physiological mechanisms are similar. And so that's what I research. Fascinating, because I mean, it explains a lot to me of why Thinking, 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 thinking back. <laughs> now, what I mean by that is when I speak to you like this right now, Elijah, this feels a certain way. Yeah. Now, if I start talking to you like this, I can still see you from my peripheral vision. I can still see you moving and everything, but I'm not going to make eye contact. And you're going to notice that the quality of the intersubjective, the connection between you and me right now feels different. Can you feel that this feels different? For sure. So when you go into thought, that's what you're doing to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're either in presence or pattern, and thought is usually yeah. a pattern. Well, and then if you're in the intersubjective one-on-one, -on -one, once you lock eyes and maintain eye contact, and so it's a physiological resonance. So I'm holding my physiology in a certain state. I'm uttering words. And then you're mapping it to your embodied knowing. And if what I'm saying is consistent with your embodied knowing, you can stay present with me. But as soon as I say something that's not in your embodied knowing, you're going to disconnect from this. You're going to go in your own referential understanding. And then you're going to, oh, okay, that makes sense. And you're going to come back. And so what's actually happening when we're speaking, it's my embodied knowing compared to your embodied knowing. <laughs> and we're just seeing how we vibe and seeing where things line up. And so if you know what to look for in engagement, you can, you can understand a person very, very quickly. And really realize when they disconnect. Well, not only that, there are four ways in which I can use language. Number one is the meta. I can use language to talk about the use of language. Number two is I can share a story or I can ask you what you think about something. And then that will direct your awareness to this mental space that we're in right now. Number three is I can ask you, how do you feel about something? How do you feel about your partner right now? And then that will direct your awareness to the somatic. And then number four is I can say, oh, wow, there looks like you've got this arch on the, 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 the left side of the screen that I'm looking at. There seems to be a curve on the edge, or, or this seems to be a pillow here. And I can direct your awareness to something here. If I say that this is my iPhone, there's no argument and there's no conflict. If I ask you how you feel, there's no argument or conflict. The only time there's going to be any kind of argument or conflict is in this mental realm. And so generally what I do when I talk to people is I look, I ask them, what are you working on? What are your things? And then I'm looking at what are the symbols that are driving them? And usually it's career, family, those are the main things. And then I speak to them in their language. And if you do this well, you go from how do you think to how do you feel and how do you feel to the emergence of this in a metaphysical way. And then if you do that well, no conflicts. Hmm. That's good feedback. Well, this is for the language part. You know, I was going to go through this. And so, so, you know, we building systems is cool and understanding that in terms of how is this being framed. And I know I'm kind of lecturing you a little bit here, but I'm also sharing with you the work that we do, and there are actually parts of my brain that become coupled to parts of your brain uh, when we maintain eye contact. And so understanding communication at the implementation level of the physiology is uh, um, 
It's the, the game that I play. Because once you have something that's physiological, it's objective and it's measurable. And once you have something that's objective and measurable, you can build a science around it. Mm. And I guess mine is more pattern recognition of the types of communication that are happening at, at, in it, at that mental level of a structured level to see how the information is flowing. Yeah. But you're giving great feedback on why it is going to flow in a certain way or not in regards to that. Yeah. Because I find... And, and then other rules, like tools where eye contact and all of this other stuff um, can, can tremendously uh, improve relationships. And, and, you know, so like even your ex-girlfriends and stuff, why do you fight? Right? <laughs> At a very deep level, the fact that you and I exist, there's a force that brings us together. Hey, we're into consciousness. There are all these forces that bring us together. What are the forces that push you apart? And they're all going to be psychologically based. There's nothing physical about it. It's all a psychological frame against frame situation. Mm. And so if I can realize that it's just a frame, and if I can then let that go or identify the trigger, and then with that awareness, bring in forgiveness to heal that, then, then I would argue you would have longer term relationships. I might have some other things I don't want to say about my interpretation of my particular relationships, but uh, hey, what do you need for what you're doing right now? Or you want to get some more feedback? Well, um, I'm doing pretty good right now. Um, uh, so, <laughs> So the, the things that I'm doing right now, I mentioned the three. And so the one, I'm, I'm basically finding more people that understand and appreciate this and then building a system for people that don't have to worry about money anymore to collectively work on mentoring these, uh, these entrepreneurs. The other thing that I'm doing right now is building this network of places, physical places around the world and people to this Betty Ford clinic for people going through awakening. And so right now I have a preliminary deck for that. And then I'm just finding who all the other experts in the area, you know, a lot of people, usually the story is in the seventies, I had an awakening experience. I was in a mental hospital. I was on pharmaceuticals for about 10 or 15 years. I was able to get myself off of them. And now I teach meditation. That's like the typical story of these people in this. <laughs> And there are many of them, <laughs> you know, you just tell them what you're doing. They're like, oh yeah, if I had something like that, when I was going through my process, it would have saved me like 10 years of my life. <laughs> and so there's that. And then the third thing is this, uh, the, uh, this global decentralized mystery school. And then that's where, especially the tools that you're using for stage two and stage three type people, you know, having a gamified way of doing things, I appreciate what the, the value of what you're doing. And then taking those into stage one people who are still in consensus reality, trying to function. And so, so on the one hand, there's a ship sinking and you wanna keep it afloat enough so that people can survive. And then on the other hand, you need to get the right people together to build the new ship that's necessary yeah. or that's emergent, that also understand it in that way. And ultimately, at that level, there isn't anything that you and I are doing. <laughs> it's just best honoring the moment and letting whatever is happening happen mm. with minimal turbulence. Definitely. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, no, I, I'm in complete agreement. Um, I'm very happy to meet you. And uh, anyone that uh, William has led me to is, is uh, I find, of, of like mind. And yeah. I think right now what's happening is there's a, a, a deeper, stronger convergence between those people who have been maybe working independently. And um, so I, I will add you, there's a number of people that are in, Van you're in Vancouver, right? Yeah. And so I added Attila when he went over of some of the people that I knew in Vancouver that were kind of in this space. You may know some of them already, but I'll add you to that group. Okay. Is that and then I, I know a lot of people in Seattle as well, too. Okay. 
Uh, so, like, what's the next step, like, in terms of pro prototype development? Because <clears throat> um, I haven't, I haven't really had a business mentor, uh, per se. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and I think because of your expertise that... Well, the main thing about this is what are you trying to do with your life? You know, what is it you really want to do? And... Here, let me explain. Do you mind if I explain a couple more things? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so all there is, is, you know, from the perspective of your awareness and from the perspective of every cell in your body, all there is to everything in the universe is just what, what's literally physically around you. There's how your body feels and there's what you know from thought. As an example, do you have a pen there? Does that pen exist? Does it exist? Yeah. How do you know it exists? It exists because I feel it, I see it. Right, great. What about Africa? Does Africa exist right now? It does. How do you know it exists right now? Because I have an understanding about. Right. So it's, it's in this mental realm. So at any one moment, everything in the entire universe, no, literally the entire universe, you either know from what's immediately physically around you. There's the internal processes of whether you're hungry, thirsty, or have to go to the bathroom. And then there's what you know from thought. And from the perspective of awareness, that's all there really is. And from the perspective of your hardware, that's all there is. So if I look at this cell in my body, what's influencing this cell? There's my finger that's touching it. There's the internal processes of the cell. And if I consciously decide to move my arm, it will influence this cell. What else is influencing that cell right now, other than its surroundings, the internal processes in my, my conscious mind? Arguably nothing. <laughs> and that's true for every cell in your body. So now when you were born, there was no symbolic consciousness. All there was was what was physically around you and how your body felt. And experiences in space and time bind symbols and thought to processes in physiology. So consciousness becomes aware of itself, becomes aware of the physiology, becomes aware of the surroundings, notices that there are objects in the surroundings. And then with that experience, you start building this mental worldview. And so certain sensations start correlating. I feel this, I feel this, that's a wee wee, that's a poo poo, a breast, milk, mother, father. And you start building this mental worldview. Physiology tries to maintain homeostasis, which reinforces a mental worldview, which motivates action, which then influences the physiology, and you have this thing. And the physiology moves to higher energy states, and the, the psychology and the physiology develop. Wilhelm Reich type stuff. And your ego kind of keeps you locked. And so your parents lay a certain pattern on you, and then you know, you're going to try to do something, and this is what happens to you. You're going to try to do something, and then it's like, oh, no. I'm not good enough or your subconscious, you know, starts fucking with you <laughs> and then it kind of falls down and then you're going to go up again and then down and gradually you're driven by the peak performance flow state. You know, why do you go dry fast? Why do you go skiing? Because that context kicks you into a flow state and it kind of works towards ex expanding that. You know, I've got a great job. Why do I want a better one? I got a great girlfriend. Why do I want a better one? Because I just want new experiences so that I can continue to grow and continue to, et cetera. That's stage one. Stage two is you, but you, you buy into consensus reality, but you're fragmented. And so all of your different projects are just new ideas of inspiration that are fragmented that keep your energy system kind of locked. Stage two is you look at consensus reality and you say, fuck this shit. I'm going all in on one thing. And when you do that, all these different fragments consolidate and coalesce into one. And then your whole endocrine system and autonomic nervous system become coupled to your perception of this one thing. When it goes up, you feel great. When it goes down, you feel down. And you're just concentrating that to go into this high energy state where you're just thinking about this nonstop, et cetera. And then that's when, you know, the divine inspiration happens. So real shit starts happening. And then you realize that there are bigger forces at work. Now, when you realize that there are bigger forces at work, what has to happen is you have to decouple the influences of the symbols on the processes of physiology. 
Now, the thing is, in stage one and stage two, the force motivating the action, the psychological force motivating that action, is going to be subtle and not so subtle forms of fear, need, and desire. Now, what happens is if you don't let go of the story-making part of the brain, you end up in this positive feedback loop and then this crash, which I told you about. And so it's like a souffle. You know, your energy system is driven by your ideas. And then when the whole thing is not be able to maintain, the whole thing collapses, which is your dark night of the soul. Now, what has to happen in stage three is you have to decouple the influences of symbols on the processes of physiology. And the reason why it's so difficult is because all of these symbols in your framing of your worldview use the same physiological mechanisms that are keeping your body physically alive and your awareness doesn't know the difference. And when you start yanking on this, it's gonna start yanking on your energy system, right? And so this is why you have these girlfriends that break up with you and everything, because you go high energy and when you're high energy, you're sensitive. And what happens is, you know, if I'm just meeting you for the first time and I may never see you again, okay, I can put up with this, whatever. But if till death do we part, <laughs> the energy goes up and all the fears and anxieties also amplify, which then destabilize this, which causes it to crash. And so what has to happen is you have to decouple the influences of symbols on the processes of physiology. The way you do that is that underneath all the stories, if you let go of all the stories, if you let all the stories go, at the very core of your being, at the very core of everyone's being, there's an inner experience that's present within everybody. And the only way I can describe this experience with words, Elijah, is that right here and right now, it's good to be alive. And if you can feel that joy, wonder, gratitude, compassion, everything comes from that. And if you really feel into it, compared to being dead right now, this is fucking amazing. And so there's a vast reservoir of energy that you can connect to. And then to make the clean cut, the only thing that's gonna save you through that process is knowing the difference between what's coming from here versus what's coming from thought. And if you let go of all of the influences of this, then the only thing that's left is what's physically around you and how your body feels, which is what it was like when you were a baby. And that in Christian terms to me is what it means to be reborn because you know that everything is by the grace of God. And in Buddhist terms, that's Buddha underneath the tree. You know, I don't know if you know the story, Siddhartha, he goes, aesthetics and everything, that's not it. And finally, he's like, fuck it, I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to get up until I figure this shit out. And then Mara shows up, all these desires come, all these fears come. And then finally, Mara shows up and says, who's here to witness your enlightenment? And he says, the earth is here to witness my enlightenment, because I know the difference between this and anything coming from my mind. <laughs> and then stage four is the mystical path. And so initially, Things happen like this, and then you start building this mental worldview. And then now for most people, it's my thoughts and my beliefs acting from here through the physiology. I engage the material world. Reality responds, which influences how I feel and how I think. So I'm doing this, moving to higher energy states and expanding my knowledge. When I fully decouple, it's back to this. I'm just here. Things show up. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to try it out. Hey, I feel like going to the bookstore today. I don't know why. I'm just going to do it. It's like throwing darts against a dartboard. Initially, you miss the wall, then you're hitting the wall. And so you're refining intuition. And then if everything that you intend happens, that's pretty good. And then stage five are special abilities. Now, some people are born with special abilities, but then they get suppressed. Some people, when they pop from stage two to stage three, they develop special abilities, but their energy system isn't stable and they're not able to hold it. But if surreal shit can happen and it doesn't phase you and it doesn't take you out of stillness, then you can develop these abilities in a grounded way. Superpowers. Yeah. Do you believe that the superpowers are activated within a, a group field ever in a more, let's say, uh, productive? Like I'm actually, my theory is there's, we need 20 people. 20 people from the Mayan galactic energy signatures. Have you studied Josera Gwe's work at all? Nope. 
within the Mayan calendar, they use a 13 by 20 mathematical system. But I'll tell you, we do this thing called the evolving caravan. And what we found is that when you get a lot of people that have done a lot of inner work, traveling together in the unknown, highly improbable things start happening. Yeah, that would be what I'm aiming at. I mean, to me, within the Mayan calendar system, they have 20 galactic energy signatures. And 20 as a number, to me, has great significance. Uh, James Miller's living systems theory, uh, tw 20 critical subsystems to create a living system, uh, 20 amino acids, it's like the tetrahedron of four, then has four, four tetrahedrons, so it's the first time you go back into a whole system. So the having 20 people activates a field of energy where then the superpowers then have a place to be seen and used together. So part of the work I'm working on is creating media teams of four and then five teams of four into a team of 20 and then seven teams of 20, each chakra getting a team of 20, and then creating a shared knowledge community of 144 people. As soon as I hang up with you, I'll add you to that group that I was, they're all in, in this kind of thing too. And they're using like gene keys and, you know, all of this stuff to understand people and then structure things to minimize turbulence. Okay. Yeah. Minimize turbulence. That's a funny thing. <laughs> I'm not so sure everyone understands what you just explained in terms of the uh, giving up mental frameworks. And what, what, what was the, the thing about the decoupling the influence of symbols on the processes of physiology. Is that the basis of your whole kind of thing? Sounds like it is. Yeah. Sounds like that's your main reference point for how Well, it's about, and for that, the way you do that is you cultivate greater introceptive awareness. Mm -hmm. So all thought really does is it just regulates the energy in your body if you think about it. If you think about it. Right? Let's say you get an endowment of $10 million, et cetera, et cetera, to do all your things. You get these big clients, your girlfriend loves you, et cetera, et cetera. How would you feel? I feel pretty good. Let's say your parents die in a horrible car accident, your house burns down, you get sued for sexual harassment, you know, you, they, someone, your CFO takes all your money away, et cetera, et cetera. How would you feel? Probably wouldn't feel too good. Physically, everything's still the same. Right, it's interpretation of reality. Yeah, and all of that is, Versus, you know, being cultivating greater introceptive awareness of being aware of how you're breathing, being able to self-regulate your energy based upon what's happening in your physiology. Wouldn't, wouldn't that, like to me, I have a model of the five communication spaces. And it's the personal space, the one-on-one -on -one space, the group space, the community space, and the sacred space. And what I'm hearing is the uh, development within the personal space, but affected by the other spaces but I find like let's say if we go to a one-on-one -on -one space right now right where there's a field of energy between us there's a type of information that's flowing there's a certain possibility that can only exist between you and I right it's, it's outside of mine it's outside of yours there's a, there's just a unique calibration there's a unique energy field between you and I and between me and every human and between you and every human and that field is, uh, I mean, has its own science, has its own dynamics. And it's the relationship between us and the knowledge that we share that has a great impact on that field. I mean, it's kind of basic stuff, but it, it just seems that in the group space and the community space, like I think the group space has taken over the community space, like the, the group mechanisms of the corporation and the uh, economic relationships of how agreements are made. Like in Victoria, there's no common space. There's, the commons has disappeared. So whatever is community space, is, it's more of a mental space of how we come together. And then I think what we're trying to do is we're creating shared reference points in that mental realm where we can actually create community together because community, in a sense, has been killed. I mean, unless for some people, I'm sure in different countries, but in Canada, we're pretty separated. It's pretty uh, cold and, and even worse now. Like if I go outside and I'm walking around, I can't even talk to anybody. And, you know, I'm watching this thing happen in my lifetime. And, you know, from what I can see, there's a design behind it. There's a design behind it by people that don't have the best interests of our species. And, you know, it's people like ourselves that 
dedicate ourselves to actually changing the, the structures of society and whatever else is in here, that right now I think it's very important for us to get together and share this knowledge because we're, we're in a situation where it could actually get worse. I mean, I'd like to think it'll get better. I'd like to think that we are evolving like the butterfly and that our species is reaching into a new level of consciousness together. But I, I don't think it's going to happen on its own. I think we have to take conscious effort. Have you figured out what you're willing to die for yet? Well, I mean, what I'm doing as my full commitment, I mean, I have had times of, of uh, wanting to die because I've- And so what I mean by that is that salmon, there's this process of salmon. They, they're actually spawned in like a pond in a, by a river, and then they actually flow down the river and they actually are saltwater creatures. They swim the big ocean. The reason why the salmon's flesh is pink is because of all the shrimp that they eat. And at some point, the salmon turn around, swim against the river, jump over all the waterfalls, avoid the bears, and they go back to their spawning ground. They spawn and then they die. And so for me, as a metaphor for life, that turnaround point is around 40 or 50. It's kind of midlife crisis. You realize you're on your way up and you're on your way out. That's one part of the story. The other part of the story is there's this unspoken of covenant where the idea is you get the planet, you inherit the planet, you know, from your parents. And the idea is you take care of it, you steward it for a while, and then you hand it to the next generation, ideally in better shape than when you got it. And that's been true for thousands of years, I would argue, until very recently. And so given all of the problems of the world today, pollution, deforestation, well, you've talked about some of them, you know, Me Too movement, war, the Palestinian Jewish issue, you know, coal, green power, food, you know, factory farming, you know, given all the problems of the world today, if you could only solve one, say, okay, this problem is solved and I'm good. You know, is, you know, I'm willing to go all in and solve, I'll take, I'll do this one. You know, have you, have you gone through that process yet? Well, I guess to me, the greatest leverage point would then be in the coming up with something and the ability to solve problems, not just one particular one, but having process to be able to solve a problem so that in that way you would be solving all the problems i mean with my well, and related to related to that so the, the main my answer to that and what i've been working on and dedicated my life to is how do we use media interactive media biofeedback intersubjective experiences and i'll touch in psychedelics but you know i'll just technology to facilitate personal transformation and induce awakening. How do you engineer enlightenment? And the premise is if you can get everyone on the planet to reconnect to and to live from the innate joy of being rather than the fears, needs, and desires driven by stories. And if you can do that on a global scale, world peace. Well, I would, I would say definitely we're, we're sharing very similar passions. I certainly like the uh, psychedelic aspect. Well, in, in relation to that, we're on the same team. And if you look at this, the more people you wake up, the less I have to do. And so I'm incentivized to help you succeed. Well, there's a lot more leverage in that, that's for sure. Right? Because if your objective is the whole planet, which is a lot of people, mm. then the more people you can do, the less I have to do. Or so sure. anything I can do to help you. And right now, it seems like the first step is to get you to, you know, A, th take the gifts that you have and then bring them to the world. And hopefully through that process, help you develop some sort of financial sustainability. Or so you don't have to worry about funding anymore. Yeah. I mean, the, the irony is it's a business thinking system. So, I mean, I've, I've got... I don't want to get into all the ironies. It's, it's, it's depressing, but 
I'm very glad to meet you and I, I sense there is synergy and uh, I do want to participate to whatever degree. So I'd love, let me know if you've got a document or anything of the different designs that you have of stuff. Just to show you some of the things that we do is we try to get people, A, we come at it from a science of consciousness perspective, which was what I was laying on you okay. a little bit. We look at it from a mythical perspective, like a Jungian archetype. So like tarot, you know, energies around cards and symbols, you know, we play in that realm. And we play around with uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and the monomyth. And so some of the things that we do with businesses is we go through and we explain the archetypal elements. There's the trickster, the enemy, you know, the, the ancient mystagogue, you know, there are all of these archetypal elements in stories. And then what we, as a sample thing, what we do is we then give them the people that they report to and, and you know, the people that they work with. And we give them a deck of archetypes. And then who is this person to you? And then you kind of match, you know, is this the enemy? Is this the ancient mystagogue? Is this the, the trickster? You know, is, is, are you a Samwise to my Frodo? You know, and how you look at those relationships. And then within an organization, you can see the framing of that and, and the understanding. If I see you as the ancient mystagogue to my, to my if I see you as the, the Dumbledore to my, uh, to my Harry Potter, then, and you see me as the Harry Potter to your Dumbledore, we have a functional relationship. But right. if I see you as, uh, what's his name, the, the, the Slytherin guy, and you see me as you know, Harry Potter, then we have a very different relationship. And so it's, it's, can you look at things not only literally, but then mythically in an archetypal kind of way. Well, and then similarly, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're going to pitch to a, ven a venture fund, it's who is this person? It's not the person, you're dealing with the threshold guardian and you have to overcome the threshold guardian. <laughs> and so then I don't say, oh, fuck it, he's an asshole, I'm never gonna work with him. It's like, ah, here's a threshold guardian. This is my challenge. I have to take the magical powers that I have. I have to be able to use my skills to conquer their threshold guardian so that I can enter the world of the unknown. And then there's the road to trials, apotheosis, return journey. Once you have a map of that and you know where you're at, then you're, you're better prepared and you're not, you're not easily taken out in terms of, oh, fuck, I'm going to kill myself now because you know that you're in the game and you know where you're at in the game. Right. And that's, I think for a systems designer, that, that can be a bit of a problem because there's so many different ways to uh, configure the concepts and the models and the maps. And I, I, I played with what you're talking about with a, a few more and I've been, you know, molding my own and, you know, I, and I haven't had many people to talk with who are at your level who are playing in the same realms, right? Who are, are moving and, and matching it. I mean, it sounds like you have designed your infrastructure and you have your, your primary language reference point. You know, you're still, it'd be interesting to see how yours match with mine. Well, yeah. And so that's where spending time together and everything. And, but I'd like to get a sense of where you're at and how I can help you as well too right now in terms of if you need manufacturers, if you need play testing, you know, I have every year I have 60 new students. We're basically like Y Combinator in a university. And every year I have 60 new students looking for projects to do. I'm, I'm, also, a, I'm also a venture partner with a venture fund. If you know Sophia, the robot that came up out of our incubator accelerator, um, I'm an advisor to a, like a dozen companies or so and everything as well too. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of, it just, it's what do you really want to do? And then what I do with entrepreneurs is figure out what is the thing, you know, and again, it's whether, the reason it has to be your relationship is whether it's a relationship or a startup, it's just some symbol that's tied to your energy system. And as the energy goes up, you know, this all in, as if your life depended on it, is what it takes. You know, when they say till death do you part, you know, there's a serious commitment there. And to see something through completely is it's the eye of the needle. Your subconscious and your shadows are going to do everything they can to keep your ego kind of locked where it's at. And so I need to find the pain point that you have of the thing that you really want to do. And then that becomes the vehicle to push you through. Okay, well, you could... Does that make sense? 
Well, to some degree, I mean, I, I feel I went through the eye of the needle after in January after a sickness and uh, I mean, every time you hit rock bottom, you, you know, there's a, there's another hole it seems. And, and I think, you know, I've been doing this 25 years, so I'm, I'm lost in it. I, I, you know, I, I've, I, uh, along the way, there's been many different treasures that I, I guess I could have brought to the world, but I sort of, I, I, when I bring it to the world, I don't do it the right way. And then I just put it back in the closet and start working on something else. So I, I, well, I the fun thing about this is I don't need anything from you or anything. So it's, it, the way I look at it is it's a question to the universe. You know, whatever we, right now, I'm just still sitting in my, my music room, you're in your room, and we're just having a conversation. And anything that comes from this, it'll, anything that we intend to do, it'll either happen or it won't. And whether it happens or not relates to us and our relationship with this, right? Even the phone call, right? Yesterday, today, all this stuff. It's like, how and why do things play out? Because ultimately at a very deep level, at a very, very deep level, I'm just a character in your dream. <laughs> and, you know, we can talk about groups and all this, but ultimately it's you and this. You know, that last breath you take is going to be you and this, right? And so can you get serious about your life? And then really, what is it you really want to do? And then act from the depth of your being. And generally speaking, if you live from your deepest truth, health, wealth, and happiness are byproducts. Because metaphysically, how and why do you think things are playing out the way they are? <laughs> Who do you think is running the show? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, so I, I sense we're coming to the end of this chat. Uh, Let me know w w what I can do to help. And then I'll send you, I'll, I'll add you to the group, and then I'll send you the deck that we do on, uh, on organizational culture, engineering culture. Okay. And then now the other thing I'd like to persuade you on, which could be fun, would be, there's another woman that I know, uh, Vittoria Patel. I'll introduce you to her. She's come up with gamified ways of getting groups together in meaningful ways. And so she's got a whole bunch, she does like organizational stuff, bridging different perspectives, and then experiential things physically in rooms and stuff. That combined with your gamified things, you've got a whole tool kit of uh, creating transformational workshops and everything. But where things are at now and where the big money is in this is that if you can do it online, because right now all of these things we're looking at, I was just using Hopin, which is an online conferencing system. Right now there's Zoom. The neat thing about Zoom is I could check, actually there's a guy right now, if you wanted, all I have to do is, uh, oh, he's online right now. But if I just sent him this link, I'd have another person show up. And so there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with the technology. But then taking especially the divination stuff that you have, because ultimately it's about creating a functional mythology. A functional mythology is created by the mythology, the art, and the rituals. And if you think of any religious tradition, it's constructed by the mythology, the art, and the rituals. And a functional mythology serves four functions. There's the cosmological function of what is reality. There's a societal function of how do we interrelate and how do decisions get made. There's the pedagogical function of how do you get people through the different stages of life or the different phases of the organization from onboarding to retirement. And then number four is the mystical function of how do you get people to see the transcendent mystery source from which all things arise. And the tools that you have created like what you're doing with chat rooms and language, the wheel, gamified cards. It allows, it provides a safe container for people to then express themselves in ways that they may not have otherwise expressed to deepen the engagement and, and, and make things more meaningful. And you've spent a lot of time gamifying that. And I see that, I recognize that work and I appreciate it. It's, it's a, if I can just share a little thing, I have a table called the Synergizer. Yeah. It's four feet round. It sits six people. You turn over three sets of cards. One's a conversation type, one's a value, and one's a conceptual lens. 
So your intention is the, is the value, your attention is the conceptual lens, and the field is the conversation type. And so each person asks a question, and then they turn over the cards, and then they answer it themselves, and then it goes to the group for their feedback question or insight. And so you do a round, and you turn over the cards, and, and I swear each time genius comes out, each time everyone gets a perfect answer, and again, it's divination. Yeah, well, there's those kind of things. There's another guy named Surya Venka who's in Seattle who works with big companies like uh, a Apple and uh, Amazon and Starbucks. And he has this whole thing with stickums and big posters. And then they just come together and co-create. You know, so they're all, these are all co-creation processes. Mm -hmm. For you, related to that, one thing that you should look up if you don't know about it is in Findhorn, you know, in Scotland, there's an intentional community. They have a thing called the transformation game, which is a board game to help. So people come in with a deep question, and then by playing that game, the answer will come out. I played the game. It's a, it's a great game. Oh, okay. As a reference, so board games that help people explore this are awesome. Yeah. And I'd love to figure out how we can take your game and even something like that, as simple as, you know, just kicking a couple thousand just to get it going or doing an Indiegogo campaign or something like that to raise funds, pre-sell it and everything, or work with, if we get a good arsenal, we could then have our own, just like IDO has their design thinking process, we could have like a whole systematized way and create a certification training program where we can then bring people through to uh, to then bring this to corporates and everyone. For sure. And it, it's, it's, it's like you're, I guess this is the perfect timing for someone like you because it's, it's ready. I mean, I, it's, uh, but I have to, you know, I have to write the manuals. I need some support in turn. Like there's a lot of little things I need support on and sort of like if we had a hundred thousand or 10,000, we figured out the right test kit and figured out like the base, Okay, hey, let's get a hundred kits or let's get a thousand kits. Send me what you've got. Cause I've got manufacturers for that in China that can drop your cost down tremendously. Okay. And then the other person that can help with that to help with the manufacturing, Attila. Attila okay. lived in Shenzhen for like five years or so. Okay. Yeah, no, we've been, we, and we're, we're creating a pretty good connection pretty quickly. And he said, he's going to help me to start to put the design specs down on paper. Like it, Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, All right. So I'll add you to those groups Okay. and then I'll add you to that group and then I'll send you the deck. Perfect. And then right. uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. And then let me know what I can do to help. But Attila is a great, a great interface person. Okay. All right. Thanks. Great to meet you, Gino. Yeah. Take care.